And with this, we'll begin with the next session. Let's now explore popular live object-based mixing platforms with this session's topic, Deploying Immersive Audio in Live Sound. This session will introduce the theor theory, walk through the production building blocks, and project concepts that guide the designs for an immersive sound reinforcement system. Ahul Samuel, live sound engineer and application engineer for the Middle East and India from L Acoustics. He's an audio engineer with over 17 years of global work experience as an FOH engineer, system engineer, and trainer. He currently is an application engineer at L Acoustics. Mr. Rahul Samuel, can you please have you on stage? Audience, please give a round of applause for Mr. Rahul Samuel. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for making it here. It's one of the first few sessions of the day, so thank you for making it. We are here to talk about immersive audio. This is the new buzzword. It's being thrown around quite a bit. There's immersive, uh, all kinds of things happening now. Uh, immersive audio happens to be one of them. And we're going to talk about that in a live sound context. It's not new. It's existed for a while in pre-produced content in the way of cinema, in the way of some other formats that you might enjoy at home. But we're going to specifically focus on how to deploy immersive when it comes to a live sound scenario. And my name is Rahul Samuel. I work as an application engineer with L Acoustics, if it was not clear already or on the slide. Uh, I'm based in uh, Dubai. I look after the Middle East and India for now. That will change soon, as some of you may know. <laughs> so what is immersive audio? And how does it come into play? And why are we talking about it now, today? In order to understand that, we need to set a bit of context. And to do that, we're going to go back in time to the 1960s, when rock and roll concerts look like that. That is not a rehearsal. That is a concert with the Beatles on stage in a stadium with a few tens of thousands of people. And with fans, teenage girls, in the audience, if you were one of the audience, you'd probably not hear much of the Beatles. That was it. What came off the stage is what was uh, available for the audience. And if you look at what was available in the way of technology, consoles, state-of-the-art consoles in the 60s had between 12 and 16 channels of input. The amplifiers could put out a whopping 150 watts of power from amps that big. Loudspeakers that were used for these concerts were not up for the job. They'd probably be more at home in a train station announcing the next departure, but definitely not for a concert. And when it comes to format for both live and for recording, it was a state-of-the-art stereo, which was based off the vinyl records that were produced at that time. Going into the 60s, a couple of decades later, we had consoles with 48 channels, no problem. Parametric EQs for every channel. High pass filters, no problem. We had amplifiers being produced by companies like Camco that were able to put out 1,000 watts, a little over 1,000 watts actually, per channel. That's a big step up. We had loudspeakers that could actually cater to stadiums, could actually cater to tens of thousands of people. We had the format didn't really change. We still have the state-of-the-art stereo at this point. But the good thing is we could put 74 minutes of high-quality stereo music in your pocket now in the 80s. And fast forward to today, we have consoles that can have hundreds of channels on them. We can have plugins, limitless pretty much. We can have all the processing power in the world. We have amps that can do 
a lot more than what was happening two decades ago. We just launched the LA Rack 3, which has three 16 channel amplifiers that can put out about 62,000 watts of power from the same weight and footprint as the amps in the 60s. We have loudspeakers that are able to throw sound more than ever. We are able to go down to 25 hertz. We are able to throw for hundreds of meters, and all while maintaining fidelity. When it comes to the format, everything evolved but the format. We are still at the state of the art stereo. We can, of course, put a lot more tracks on, on your device now in your pocket, but we are still with a format that was invented in the 1930s, the stereo. So this is a picture from 2019, Coachella uh, Arts and Music Festival. It's one of the biggest music festivals in the world. As you can see, beautiful, wrapped around, immersive video screen. We have all the lighting in the world you will need for a stage this size. But we have amazing loudspeakers that can throw for hundreds of meters, but the format. So now, at this point, came a question, should we, what should the next big thing be? Should it be 1 or 2 dB improvement over what we can deliver in the way of loudspeakers? So should we be focusing on the transmission of audio at this point, now that we've come such a long way in transmitting sound over long distances? Or should we focus on the format itself? Should something change? So, talking about format, let's put things into perspective. This is a performance. Let's say a performance in the early 1900s. No amplification. You have artists on stage, they perform, you hear them. But you hear them only up to a distance, right? There's a limitation in how loud I can speak without a microphone. There's a limitation in how loud a guitar or a violin can get. But the good thing, if you were within that range of where the audio would reach, you would know exactly where the artists are on stage without ever looking at the stage, correct? But now, because of this PA, even though I move across the stage, my sound to you is not going to move. Whether I'm there or here doesn't matter. That's what happens, that's what doesn't happen here. That's the good thing about having a non-amplified performance. Now, moving on to how do we get more of the audience involved in this performance? How do we get the audience to reach, uh, the uh, performers to reach further into the audience? For that, we're going to need what we call reinforcement or amplification. You're going to need some kind of a system to make things louder. And this is a beautiful system, a left-right system, a typical system that we're used to seeing. So we have a nice left-right system. This is what we're used to seeing. This is what we'd expect in the way of reinforcement. So this creates a uniform coverage for your whole audience, a uniform coverage in the way of volume, amplitude, in the way of frequency response. So your, your tonality is being maintained from front to back, left to right, across your audience. They're all hearing the same thing. But what about the signals that we're sending to this system? Are we really mixing stereo? We're sending left to the left, good. We're sending right to the right, good. That part looks okay. You look at the front fills, we're sending a combination of signals. You look at the center, you're sending a combination of the signals to, to use as a center fill. So the question comes back, are we really mixing stereo? When we say left, right, how many mix engineers in the house? How many, how many people actually are at a desk? Uh, how many system engineers in the house? There are a few. We all know we don't really mix stereo. What happens when you mix stereo? What we're doing is dual mono. And the reason for that is going to come on the next slide. So what happens in dual mono is all these locations for your audience, they're going to get squished. And all of them are going to come from one point in space, which is a mono system. right? And this is, of course, going to hit intelligibility, because now you're squishing your whole performance into one system. It's coming out of one point in space. You're going to are going to have problems with spatializing. We all know that it's only in the middle when you pan, it's going to work. If I move to the left of my audience, if I move to one side, I'm going to hear everything coming off one side of the PA, because I am closer to that side of the PA. If I pan anything on the other side of the PA, 
all the audience on that side will think the sound is coming from that side of the stage, even if I'm standing on this side of the stage. So for you guys, you're actually hearing my voice from there, not from where I'm standing. So that's what's going to happen with dual mono. And the reason we do that is to avoid loss of coverage, right? You, do, you don't sell tickets to your show saying, OK, how many bass guitar fans? You get the house left seats. How many guitar fans? You get the house right seats. That doesn't happen. Everybody needs to hear everything. So we are breaking that audiovisual connection, which is happening right now in this room as well, as I speak through my microphone. These are the compromises that we're making. There is, there is a constant and perpetual conflict between localization of what's happening on the stage versus what you're hearing in the audience. And amplified sound, this is, this is, this is what we end up hearing. We hear everything together in one place when you mix in mono. There's no separation. And this is seen, this is perceived as an artificial barrier, especially for theatrical performances, for performances where you need movement, where things need to move about. You can't do that with a, with a, with a dual mono system. They're always going to come out of the same place no matter where you place that object. So this is, this is a barrier. This is something we don't think about anymore because we've been doing it since the 1930s since the 1960s when performances started growing larger. And today, we keep doing this, but we don't think about this visual disconnect that happens. And this uh, incorrect localization will actually cause listening fatigue. This adds to the fatigue for your audience. When your audience is hearing something and seeing something, there's this constant conflict in their brain trying to tell you that, no, the object's there. He's speaking from there, but I'm hearing him from here. So there's this constant conflict that adds to the fatigue, among other things. What also happens is masking. What is masking? We're all familiar with the mask by now. But it's not that mask. It's a different kind of mask. It's masking because when you send multiple sources, different kinds of sources, into one system, you're making that system do all the work. And when you look at it from a musical perspective, this is what it looks like. If you see, if you draw a line down the middle, you see there's a lot of overlap between instruments. And we know this. As mix engineers, we know this. If you have vocals and lead guitars and uh, uh, rhythm guitars and snare drum, they're all going to conflict. You're going to have to make space in your mix. That's what you call it, right? You're going to have to gain ride. You're going to have to ride your fader when you, when you, when you're, as you go through the performance. And in order to, to counteract this masking that happens, in order to, to help different instruments compete with each other and win at different points in, in your performance, you're going to use EQ. You're going to use EQ to try and create that separation. Uh, lead vocals and lead guitar are classic examples, because they both usually sit in that same space. They're fighting for the same space, and then both need the same amount of attention. You're also going to use dynamics. You're going to use compressors on your snares, and on, your, on your toms, on your uh, other very dynamic instruments. You're going to try and create that separation from, uh, by, by using dynamics. And because of all this, you're going to affect, you're going to, you're going to degrade the natural tone. By now, we're used to hearing things a certain way. Not because it's the only way or the only right way of doing it. We're used to it because that's the only way we've known. When you go to a concert, you expect the lead guitars to sound a certain way. You expect the vocals to sound a certain way. But that's because of all this processing that happens in the background. How many of you remember sound check to show transitions? For those of you who mix, when you're doing sound check, you're listening to one instrument at a time. You always EQ that differently, especially for the newer engineers. And that's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing that younger engineers have, this, uh, have to do this. You have to go through the process of mixing, EQing each instrument separately, and then you put it together, and then you frantically go and try and EQ things again and try and adjust levels again to try and get separation. But this is not because you did the EQ wrong in the first place. This is because the system is now masking what you did before. And you have to counter that masking by doing additional EQ, by doing additional uh, compression to, to create that separation. There's another problem. Now that we've done all this, we found a workaround. We did the EQs, we did the compression, we did the dual mono, we minimized the overlap between the left and right. 
But think of this scenario where you have an audience that is sitting far back, let's say at Peter's position. Peter, can you raise your hand, please, so everybody knows where you are. So at Peter's position, he's not just hearing that side of the PA. He's actually hearing both sides of the PA, which is not good. Because at that position, they are going to overlap. They're going to arrive at different times. This will get to him first. And that system will get to him 5, 10 milliseconds later. So this is going to cause impulse degradation. It's very evident in a snare drum. When you go to, as you move to the back, a snare or a tom, it starts sounding very different. That's because of this, this, this overlap, this part difference that's happening. You will also have tonal coloration in things like vocals and anything, actually. It just, it just uh, presents itself with different symptoms, but it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's comb filtering that happens from front to back. And we can't change this. We can, what we can do is minimize this overlap, this green patch that we have in the middle. That's what we do when we design a large format left-right system. You're trying to minimize the overlap. You all must have heard the minus six point. You don't want to go more than minus six if you're doing a dual mono setup. So that's what you're trying to do here. So this is another compromise that we make. When it comes to audio-visual localization, and when it comes to our brain and how we tell where things are, it's, it's a combination of these two things. And there is a certain amount of accuracy that one or the other provides you with. In hearing with our ears, we can tell to an accuracy of between one and three degrees, which is pretty accurate. So if I had to turn this mic and move on stage, you could, you could within one to three degrees tell where I'm standing on the stage without looking. In the vertical, it's between 10 and 20 degrees. Can anyone tell me why? Sorry? Because your ears are not oriented this way. Because your ears are in the horizontal plane. So you can tell a difference when it moves this way. To be able to tell the vertical, I'm going to need another ear somewhere here. So I can tell when something went from down to up. Yeah? So visually, we're a lot more precise. We know this. You see something, you can put your finger on it. And this is a 60th of a degree, which is very, very accurate. And localization, as you would understand, is driven primarily by sight. Because we've learned over time, through habit, from when we were born, we continuously, over the years, learn that we are more accurate when we see things and point at them than we hear things and point at them. So over time, you train yourself to do that. But this is the opposite of what happens at a concert, right? You're trying to see. You're trying to hear at the same time, but there's a complete mismatch in that. And that's what this slide is trying to show you, that mismatch between the, the vocalists being on that side of the stage and actually hearing them from this side of the stage just by virtue of being on that side of the venue. So we did a little study to tell how much mismatch is OK, because we all have tolerances, right? Like machines have tolerances. We as human beings have a certain amount of tolerance. And it's OK to have a certain amount of error. In the vertical, it's OK up to 30 degrees, which is why it's OK to have your stage down there and your PA up there. Because we can't really tell the difference between up to 20 degrees. And up to 30 degrees is fine. We can tolerate that. However, in the horizontal, it's a whole other story. It's 7.5 degrees. Mismatch. Not accuracy. Our accuracy is still 1 to 3 degrees. But if I'm seeing something there and I'm hearing something 7.5 degrees out, my brain will consider those two signals as the same signal in terms of location, where you are, where that, where that source is. What it also does, how many of you know the Hass effect or the cocktail party effect? The effect, even if you don't know the technical term, the, 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 the scientific explanation for it, you know that if you're in a busy room, like this one with the drone, you could drown out the drone. That drone actually worked out quite nicely. It's a perfect example of the cocktail party effect, the Hass effect, where we as human beings, we have the ability to switch something off and listen to one thing or the other. But you can't, you can do that only if these sounds are coming from two different points in space. The drone was coming from above you. My voice is coming to you from the sides here, right? So that's why it worked. However, if I were to give one of you another mic, and put you on stage here, you, can't, you won't have that same ability to separate that person's voice from my voice, because they're going to come from the same point in space. So separation and intelligibility is helped a lot when you move 
things out in space. But when we're mixing in mono, we're squishing everything and putting it at a one point in space. So we lose this ability to separate. We lose this ability to do the cocktail, uh, to experience the cocktail party effect. Now you see where the immersive system comes in. Now instead of mixing to one end or the other of the stage, you're able to actually place objects close to where they are on stage. So this allows you, one, to localize them correctly, to tell where they are. Two, it gives you back the ability to separate things. And this is what we call spatial unmasking. It's a term that we throw around a lot in the ELISA environment, but it would apply to some other, not all, but some other immersive platforms as well. But this is one of the ideas behind spatializing things, to give the listener, you, the power back to choose what you want to listen to. If you would remember, for those of you who didn't, who went to audio school not that long ago, you would have been told how classical music conductors have the ability to listen to one instrument among the hundreds that are on stage, and that is only possible because they're all sitting at separate points in space. If you give this classical conductor a pair of IEA monitors and put them on stage, they cannot tune into one instrument at a time. They will listen to the whole thing at the same time, which is why you will never see a musical conductor with in-ear monitors one. Even if they have stage monitors, they would like to have control to turn it down when they need to. If they will turn it down, they will listen to one violin. You, second violin, second, your violin's out of tune. But you can't do that if you don't have this ability to separate things. But you, as audience, can do that as well. You don't need to be trained. Of course, to have that ability to tell whether something is in tune or not, you need to be trained. But you don't have to be trained to separate the drone from me. You could still listen to me. The experience doesn't just come from seeing all these speakers all around you. It actually comes, there's a lot more that having all these speakers around you brings for your audience experience. It allows them, it gives them the power back to hear what they want to hear. So when it comes to the immersive solution that we provide as L Acoustics, we have a very clever panning algorithm that uses amplitude only. There's two ways you can do immersive. You can do immersive with a time-based panning algorithm, or you can do immersive with an amplitude-based panning algorithm. What we do is amplitude-based, which gives you this power of spatial unmasking, because there's no time involved. So when I move away from him, I'm actually moving away from him in space, and he's only coming off that one loudspeaker, and I'm only going to be coming off this one loudspeaker. That's only when you get this power of spatial unmasking. I won't get into it in detail today. It's out of the scope of a uh, of, of one-hour talk. It's probably more like a one-week workshop. But if you're interested, you can go on to our website, and we have some white papers that you can download and read. We talk about different panning algorithms, pros and cons, how they work. It'll help you understand what you're doing when it comes to an immersive uh, solution. There's another thing, distance. What is distance? If you were talking to someone in the hallway outside and they were to walk away from you, what are you going to expect? Sorry? Reduction in level, you're going, to, you're going to experience that. So when someone actually moves away from you, you can close your eyes and tell that they're moving away from you, right? Which means there are some auditory cues that they are giving you as they move away from you. When it comes to a performance on stage, we have traditionally seen the stage as a flat piece of paint, right? I'm going to be here or I'm going to be there. But we've never looked at depth. It's not a new concept again. It's not something I'm bringing to the table or explaining to you today. It's always existed in the recording world. Yeah? You always create depth. You push something back in a mix. You bring something forward in a mix. That context has changed a bit. We push back and bring forward just by pulling a fader up and down. But there's a lot more to that. If I walk away from you, I'm, of course, going to drop in level. I'm going to also send less HF energy to you, right? There's going to be an HF reduction as I move away from you. There's also going to be the room that kicks in. So if you're in a hallway, you're going to hear more of the reverb reflected sound from the room coming in and less of my direct voice reaching you. So that, these are three things, three, uh, three contributing factors for distance. And we are able to do this in an immersive system. And you don't have to go and fine tune these three knobs, gain, HF, and reverb is just one slider called distance. You pull in distance, and the object will move back in the mix. And this is part of the panning algorithm for an immersive system. So this is another dimension that you're adding to your mix. You're giving it width. 
you're increasing the resolution of this, this canvas that you have in the way of stage, you're also gaining depth with just one fader. Can you do it yourself manually? Yes, you can. It's going to take you a really long time, and you probably won't get it right. But in the algorithm, you just pull the slider, and the object moves back, and it works. It works. You have to hear it to believe it. So it, the first two, fairly straightforward. The third one is what we call the room engine, which is like a reverb unit, but it's not a reverb unit. It's different, because it's recreating a space. Our reverb units, traditionally, are designed to come out of one speaker. Right? The direct sound comes out, and the reverb comes out of the same speaker. But now, in an immersive situation, you have multiple speakers. So when the object's coming out of there, where are you going to send the reverb from? Are you going to send it from there, from there, from there, from there? This is a choice. And if we were to manually make this choice for every object, for every panning location, it's going to be a really complex task. So when we were designing this room engine for the, uh, uh, for the immersive ELISA system, there were some criteria that were set about. One of the important things was transparency. It needs to be neutral. It needs to sound like a real room if we were to do it. And in a real room, all the reflection doesn't come from one point in space, right? It's going to be from there, it's going to be from that wall, from that wall. So it's going to come from different surfaces at different times with different intensity to you. So that's, that's one of the key factors for the room engine in an immersive solution. So the second factor is to retain clarity in a very dense arrangement. All of us, no, not anymore. Now you're all digital console people. So when we started touring on analog desks, you would get the smallest rig in the warehouse, which would have one reverb unit and one delay unit, and you're going to send everything through that one. Very soon you learn you shouldn't put too many things through that reverb unit because it becomes a mess, right? Because it can handle only so much, and beyond that, it starts degrading. So one of the key factors with the room engine is it needs to be able to maintain clarity in very dense arrangements, because you might have 128 objects on stage feeding into this, uh, into this immersive system, and you, in, and you don't want the, that room engine to fall apart just because there's so many things coming in. We want to look after early reflections. This is coming back to my point of, if the direct sound's coming from here, where do you want the reflections to come from? Definitely not here, right? Because the reflections are not coming from me. The reflections are going to come from other parts of the room. So maintaining this orientation of direct sound source versus the reflections is an important factor to, to bringing back the natural acoustics into, into an immersive mix. Now, we run into a problem. And we have a solution for the problem, which is why I'm highlighting it now. We ensure precedence. So when I speak, in, in this case, my voice should always reach you first, and the reflection later. Why? Because from me to you is the shortest path. Once it hits the floor, that path is longer. Once it hits that wall, it's even longer. Once it goes all the way back and comes back, that's the longest path to you. When it comes to generating reverb, we traditionally have very little control because the reverb and the direct sound come out of the same loudspeaker. But now they're coming out of different loudspeakers. So we're going to run into a problem. And that problem looks like this. The reverb in red might actually reach you before the direct sound. Is that natural? No, it's very unnatural. If you will lose intelligibility for one, based on how the reverb is tweaked. The direct sound from the stage might actually sound like an echo, which is not what you want. You want to maintain intelligibility. You want to in maintain impact from your stage and then add room to it. So this is a problem that needs to be considered when you're designing immersive systems. Because now you have multiple sources at different path lengths to your audience. And you have sound coming out from all of them at the same time. But you want to guarantee that everyone inside your audience will always hear the direct sound first. So inside the uh, ELISA processor, we have a, a precedence guarantee, because the processor knows where all the speakers are. If I pan something from here and I send it out into the audience, it's going to do something like this. It's going to wait, 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 until the direct sound has actually reached that loudspeaker and treat that loudspeaker like a wall at that point, and then send you sound back into the room. You see that? 
So no matter where in the audience you are, you will always, always hear what's coming from the stage first, because the laser processor knows that it takes that long for that sound to come from that position to that position. So I'm going to fire that speaker this many milliseconds later. I'm going to fire that speaker this many milliseconds later. This guarantees for every listener position, which means no matter where in the room you are, it also guarantees for any object position. So if I were to take myself as an object and put it at the back of the room, it's going to change that whole precedence. It's going to change that whole reverb, how it works. So you're going to still hear the reverb after you hear me coming from the back. 3.2. 3.2 milliseconds for the processor latency. This is a full processor? Sorry? Full processor? Yeah, it's the, it's the default. It's the, it's the max. 3.2 is the max latency for the processor pass through. So a quick recap. Now we've set the foundation. From here, we're going to start moving on to how we're going to look at designing such a system. So when you look at a stereo system, or more realistically, a dual mono system, you're going to have very limited pan range because you just can't pan. The system's not designed to be panned. You're going to have comb filtering based on just having two sources doing the same thing. You're going to have there's some interference here. Limited spatialization. That goes back to point number one of having limited pan range. You're going to have minimal separation because you're squishing everything and sending it out of one speaker. In an immersive, in our example today, Elisa, you're going to have the freedom to pan anywhere you want. Wherever you have a speaker, you are free to throw audio onto that speaker, and it'll work. You have no interferences, because when you're, we use the uh, amplitude-based panning. So if I pan myself there, I'm only coming out of that one loudspeaker, which means you will hear me from there, and everyone else is hearing me from there. There's no other speaker adding interference to that voice coming out of that one loudspeaker. You have uniform spatialization, which means you can pan anywhere, and it'll sound the same. And you have natural separation which is what we saw from the little experiment we both did standing on this stage. So how do you deploy an immersive system? There are three things you need to consider. We're, of course, not going to get into all the details of how to do it, but today's session is more to give you a foundation to build on, to point you in the right direction where to go and look for information. So the three pillars. The first one is design. You, of course, still need to design a loudspeaker system. The Elisa processor is not going to design the system for you. You have to do it. You have to decide, make some decisions in that design. There are tools that are available from all, uh, uh, there are tools that are available to help you with, the, with all the steps of designing a, uh, an immersive system for your event. We have processing happening in, in the processor. There's things you need to consider, the workflow, the signal flow, all those kind of things. And you're going to have to control it at the end of the day. It's not going to do it for you. It's not AI. I wish it were, but it's not. There's still some clever things you can do with tracking, with automated, automated tracking, which is becoming very common now because lighting people are getting lazier, video people are getting lazier. They want to track everything automatically. So why should we not do that same thing? Just tap into the tracking system, and we can do some really cool stuff. So let's talk about the first one, design. What do you think it takes to design an Elisa system? This is a question for you. What would you need to do? Is there anything different you need to do from your left-right system? Think about it. Content that you need to think about. Yeah, you, you need to think about your content. More speakers, more boxes around. You may need more speakers, more than two, maybe more than one at least. Sorry? You'll all have to speak up louder. Yeah. Position of the speakers, where they are. Do you want to think about position of the speakers? I like where this is going. You're all thinking on the right track. The good news is you're still going to. Yes, sorry. Auditory model has to be similar. Yeah, yeah. Do you realize something happening here? These are all the exact same things you would do for an LR system, right? These are all things you would ask yourself. These are all things you would do. The only additional thing you're going to have to do is the number of loudspeakers. How many do I want to put? And where do I want to put? But everything else you did for a traditional left-right system will still apply. You still want to know what the content is. You still want to know where you can put your speakers. You still want to know what kind of SPL. You still want to know where you want to cover, how much you want to cover. So everything that you did before is not lost. 
you still need that information. And it's good that you have that experience already deploying a simple system, because now you just need to replicate that system 5, 7, 10, 27, 36, how many ever times you want to put, how many ever loudspeakers you want to put in that space. So when it comes to an ELISA system, our minimum is five speakers spread across the width of the stage, which we call the performance zone. And these five need to be identical. Why do you think they need to be identical? Tonality should be same when you pan it. Very good. Because when you pan something, you don't want it to change. You want it to sound the same. So you want at least five. This is minimum. This is not maximum. This is the least you're going to need in order to put an, uh, an immersive system together. You're going to have them be full range for the same reason. You want them to maintain tonality as you pan things. You want to have maximum shared coverage. So when we design a traditional dual mono system, we are trying to minimize overlap, right? We're trying to do as little as we can to get to that minus six point where if someone walks, it sounds like it hasn't changed. But in, in an immersive situation, you want to make sure every speaker is covering all of the audience. Because when I pan something on any one speaker, everybody should hear it, and not just one side of the venue or the other. Does that make sense? That's the only big difference coming from traditional system designs to immersive system designs. You can, of course, add things. You can have extensions outside the stage. These extensions usually help you make your mix sound bigger than it actually is. Who doesn't love that? You can put in effects. You can put reverbs. You can put special sound effects. You will, of course, want subwoofers. No one's doing a gig without subs today. You'll want to fly them somewhere in the middle. And the reason for that is that's the most equidistant point to all of the different arrays in your system. So that's the maximum coupling you'll get when your subs are in the center. So when we're doing an immersive system with a frontal, when you do a 360 system, it's a lot more complicated. We can't get into that today. But when you're doing a frontal system with a stage, you can do that. These are all optional bits. The only mandatory bit is five speakers. They don't have to be five line arrays. I could do this room in immersive with five X8s here, and I could walk across the stage, and it's, it's an immersive show, it's an Elisa show, because all I need to do is reproduce my speech. We can have fills, front fills, under balconies, delays. All of these can be mono, like we are used to doing, or they can be spatialized. So we can actually have something called spatial fills across the front. So when you pan something on the main PA system, it's also going to pan for the VIPs who are sitting in the front. You want money for your next show, you want to make sure that is spatialized as well, right? Otherwise, they're going to walk and be like, this sounds exactly like the left-right system. Nothing moved. But when you spatialize it across there, then those stakeholders who are sitting in the front are still going to have the same panning experience that the rest of the audience is having. So spatial fills, that's something to think about. We can go crazy. We can have surrounds on the sides. We can have overheads. At this point, we can confidently say that we have fully immersed our audience in sound. Yeah? How, this, how the panoramic extensions work will depend on the content. Do you want to pan the main vocals to the side? Then you're probably going to need the same size speaker that you have for your scene system out there. So instead of five, you're going to need 27 going all around. Or you can say, OK, no, I'm never going to move my vocals off the stage because my vocalist is always going to be on the stage. But I want to do some special effects in the side. Then you can downsize your surround system, which is what you see here. You see smaller boxes. And as you go overhead, you're probably not going to put very important things up there. So you can have even smaller speakers out, out there for the overheads. Any questions so far? I'll repeat your question, don't worry, you finish. It's always the case that the mic won't work when I use it. <laughs> yeah, so basically if you put a tracker on a guy, yeah. okay, and he's singing and say he he's between the center speaker and the inner left, are you going to have comb filtering between those two K2 rigs? That is a very good question. This session is getting advanced now. Uh, I can answer your question outside, but in very short, yes it will. And you are right. When you put the same source 
two large speakers, you're going to have comb filtering. But when it comes to designing speaker systems, we have certain rules that we follow. There can be only so much space between one speaker to the next, depending on how far There's the a closest, minimum distance. Yeah. So you have a minimum path difference for the audience down there. So we are aiming for less than 15 milliseconds end to end. And that usually is enough to cater to any adjacent speaker gaps. That's around 160 feet. 30 meters, yeah. Uh, 15 milliseconds. 1.13. Yeah, yeah, some, yeah, yeah. It, this also depends on how far the first line of audience is. So it depends on the audience plane. Okay. So if, the, if, this, if this distance is more, then you get more this way. But we know that at some point it stops and they're like, oh, no, you need to have your audience here. So there are ways to counter that. For example, we start the scene system coverage slightly further back and use spatial fills to do the front bit. Okay. So there are ways, which is why I said it's, a, it's an advanced it's a, it's question. A, it's a, a very good question. Yeah, we'll, we'll chat about it. Uh, but yes, you're right. It will comb filter, but there are, there are rules in place. Of course, you need rules, right? If you don't have rules, then things are not going to work that well. So there are rules in place, and those rules will ensure that the effect of that is minimal on the uh, performance that is reaching the audience. So in the way of design tools, this is sound vision. How many of you have used sound vision here? There are a few people. A little bit, yeah. There are a few people who have used sound vision. Those of you who have used sound vision, might say, wait a minute, I've never seen these tools in my sound vision, ever. What's going on here? This is not sound vision. No, this is sound vision. These are tools that are there specifically to help you with the Lisa loudspeaker system design, because there are some rules, as Warren brought up, there are some rules that need to be followed, and you need to know when you've broken those rules. And there are tools built into the software that will tell you, stop. At this point, you're, going, you're breaking this, you're breaking that. And it's not just the mapping, because looking at mapping and telling whether something is right or wrong is a little harder sometimes. You need a lot of experience to tell things from mapping. There are very objective numbers like this. I don't know if you can read the numbers at all, but there are numbers here. There are things like max SPL. There are things like time. There's things like spatial resolution, vertical resolu uh, uh, resolution, horizontal re resolution in the way of just numbers. So when you're designing and you've made a change, you can see whether these numbers are improving or if the numbers are degrading, so it'll help you. These numbers also help you go up to stakeholders, the production manager, hey, I want a Lisa. Why do you want a Lisa? Because stereo does this, here are five numbers, and a Lisa does this, here are another five numbers. So you decide which one's better. So it, it becomes a little easier to talk to someone who's not very technical and tell them what they're gaining by by moving from a five scene system to a seven scene system or a seven scene system plus two extensions. So what are you gaining by doing that? And those come out in very, very simple numbers there. The same set of tools, the same rules apply to a frontal only system or a surround system or a fully immersive system. I'm surprised no one asked how do we get access to these ELISA tools. In order to get access to these ELISA tools, you need to be an ELISA certified loudspeaker system designer. So for that, you need to do a course. We walk you through all the rules, because unless you know the rules, how do you know how to break them? That's the main reason you learn rules, right? You learn them, so you learn how to break them. So we need to teach you those rules, and once you finish your certification, you get the certificate with the certificate, you get a license key. And you put that license key in SoundVision, it unlocks the ELISA tools for you. The second pillar is the processor. This shouldn't take too long. It's a hardware unit that receives audio, sends out audio, processes audio. It also receives some other things that we're going to talk about. We can do 128 inputs, 128 outputs. 96 of those can be objects. So an object is like a channel on a console. So you can have 96 objects go in. We, of course, do classical concerts a lot in Elisa. And they often go over 96. What we do in that case, is we submix, so we'd send all the first violins into two, two, two channels, all the second violins into two channels, and so on and so forth, and you can submix the whole thing down inside Elisa. We can have, as we said, Elisa speakers, we can have spatial fills, which are those fill speakers that you're going to use in the front. All of this processing is done at 96 kilohertz. 
inside the processor. We have MADI and AVB interfaces, both on the in and the out. Now that we have a processor, we have loudspeakers, everything is going in, and the next step is to learn how to control it. Because if you can't control the beast, you're going to run into trouble. When it comes to control, the good news is you're still going to do everything you do on your desk. Nothing changes. You're still going to mix a channel strip. You're going to do gain. You're going to do EQs. You're going to do everything that you did in your, on your console before. The only thing that is going to change is you're going to remove the pan knob from your desk. And you're going to replace the pan knob with an ELISA controller. So now, instead of just panning from left to right, you're going to be able to grab an object. So at this point, a channel is called an object. Because you can take that object and you can place it anywhere in the room, not on a loudspeaker. That's the important distinction. Because when you're mixing a traditional stereo mix, you're placing your sound on a speaker. You're panning that sound to a speaker. You can fake a speaker in the middle, but you can fake it only for someone who's sitting in the middle. Once you move there, that panning doesn't work anymore. In an immersive situation, the kind of mixing is called object-based mixing, because now you're mixing objects and not channels. And you can place an object anywhere in this space. And what that'll do is that'll take all this information. So stepping back one step, you're going to take direct outs from your console per channel, post fader, and you're going to send those direct outs into the ELISA processor. And every channel will be associated with what we call object data, which is all this panning information. Your location, your width, your distance, your elevation, because we can also pan vertical. You don't just pan horizontal. You can pan anywhere. So all these loudspeaker position data, so this is combined with the loudspeaker position data. So I want to put my voice here. So where are all the other speakers? And the ELISA immersive processor is going to take these two different overlay of information, put it together and say, if you want to sound like you're coming from here, you need to come out of these loudspeakers. That's what, that's what the ELISA processor does. It sounds very simple. I make it sound very simple, but it's not. Trust me. It's a very, very clever, very complex algorithm that does that for you. So that's what we call object-based mixing. And this is where the controller is going to come in. Uh, we're going to look at the controller on the next slide. So all the audio rendering happens there. The combination of object location and speaker layout is going to be combined, and it's going to send it out to the appropriate loudspeakers, wherever they are. From an overview, this is what it looks like. We're going to need something called an ELISA controller, which is going to run on a computer. That is like a control surface for the processor. The processor doesn't know what's happening. The processor is just receiving input crunching the numbers and sending the audio out of the correct channel. From the processor, uh, sorry, from your program, you're going to send the inputs into your console, just like you do today. There's nothing different about it. The only difference is there, instead of sending to your left-right bus, you're now going to send all the direct outs per channel into your ELISA processor. And from there, it's going to go collect the data from ELISA controller that tells you where I should place each object and send that into the loudspeaker system. Does that all make sense? All clear so far? Good. So what is an ELISA controller? It's a piece of software that runs on your computer. Like I said, it's a control surface. You will have different uh, control softwares like this for different immersive platforms, but they will all do the same thing. They will all help you put in that object data in there. Channel number one, I want you here. Channel number two, I want you here. But now we don't call them channel. What do we call them? Objects. Object number one goes here. Two goes here. Three goes here. So that's what you're doing inside the controller. But there's other cool things it does. It's touchscreen friendly, which means I can have a little touchscreen next to my console. I can be mixing. And when I want to move something, just grab the object and move it wherever I want. You can sync it with time code. So if you're running a show on time code, the controller can receive time code. You can have preset positions for things. And at that time, the object will automatically move wherever it needs to move. You can do snapshots inside there, just like you would do snapshots on your desk. You can also do some very cool automation via external control. And for that, we're going to need third-party controllers. We have Elisa Desk Link, which is a protocol we've developed for console manufacturers. So this happens with Yamaha, SSL, Digico. If you're on any of these desks, you never will have to leave the desk to 
do an immersive show. You can actually, the, the Elisa panel opens per channel on the console, and you can just go horizontal pan, vertical pan, width, elevation. You can do it right there on the console. You never have to leave the environment. We can do it with plugins. These are the different formats of plugins that are available. A plugin is what you will use on an Avid console. Avid console doesn't do desk link, but Avid console does plugins. So you can still use uh, Elisa through there. The cool thing, tracking. Anything that can send out RTT RPM or Posi stage net, we can receive that into Elisa controller. You don't have to set up a new tracking system. If there is a tracking system for cameras and follow spots already, just go to them with a network cable. Be like, can I plug it in? And we can track that. You can set limits. So you can say, OK, I don't want Rahul's voice to go outside three meters. So once I get here, three meters, panning will stop. Even if I move, my voice will still remain there. So there's a lot of cool things you can do in the way of automatic tracking there. Show control software, OSC. A lot of show programming is done on OSC now. OSC is a very powerful tool to interact with Elisa. If you have a software like QLab, you can do some really crazy stuff for immersive mixes in the way of automating the, the whole thing. You can also do MIDI, MIDI program changes, for those of you who still love MIDI, for whatever reason. It's there, and you can use it. Oh, you said three. What's the fourth one? Why did you say three when there are four? Because the fourth one depends on what you're trying to do. It is to do with pre-production, with preparing a show beforehand. Uh, you can do this at home. We have, uh, in our case, we have a, a controller software with a virtual processor that you can use with headphones and mix in binaural at home. So you can actually mix your show, immersive show, do the automation, because that takes time. You can't have your artist be like, stop, stop, stop. Can you go back 10 seconds and play that 20 times while I get my location right? No, that's not going to happen. But you can go into a DAW, loop 10 seconds, and then try and get your position in. So you can do that. This software is free. You can download it on your computer. Not right now. Wait for the session to be over. You can go home, download it. There's a YouTube playlist that will help you walk you through the whole install and setup process. And you can start playing with Elisa at home on your headphones. If you have a head tracker, they, they come fairly easily now. I think 50, 60 euros, you get a head tracker. You can stick it on your headphone. And when you move your head, it'll track that. And it'll be a fully immersive mix on your headphones. You can also do this on speakers. You can set up a little studio. If you have a studio, you just need to add more speakers. So you can have a scaled down version of your Elisa loudspeaker layout and mix on that before you go to your actual show. This is, this is the recommended way of preparing for a show. You can also call your mix engineers to your warehouse if you're a rental company. Do a simulated small scale setup of the Elisa show and be like, here, spend a day, fine tune your mix, and we'll go on site and do the rest. In terms of workflow, uh, I'll quickly run through this. It's, uh, you're going to need your venue. You're going to put it in a pre-production setup. This can be speakers. These can be headphones. You're going to mix the show. You're going to put that out. The same controller file from your studio can be go straight plug into your live processor. You don't need the processor for studio at home. You can run the virtual processor. You run your show. Once your show is done, you want to make some changes, take that controller file from your live show, go back home, tweak it, send it back again for the next, next day's show. So here's a quick example of what things look like. Speaker layout design inside SoundVision software, in our case for Elisa, looks like this. There will be similar softwares for other immersive solutions as well. None of them as good as ours, but there are. Uh, you can import that speaker layout into Elisa controller straight. So you just grab the file. It'll bring the speakers into Elisa controller. So now Elisa processor knows where the speakers are. You can uh, connect your DAW. You do a virtual bridge. Uh, there's some interference here. But if you see there, there's uh, Elisa audio bridge. That's the processor, virtual processor. Send all your signals to the virtual processor. Receive it back on your headphones. We have control flags. You can choose where you want to control the objects from. You want to do it from plugin, from snapshot, from trackers, from automatic trackers, OSC. You can set all that up. 
Now, where are you going to use immersive? Immersive can be used everywhere. You can orchestral shows, classical shows have the highest adoption. I do a lot of show support for Elisa when I travel for new uh, for customers who are using Elisa for the first time. Most of the shows that I go and support are classical concerts. It's because of that separation. When you have a hundred plus sources on stage, you don't want them all coming out of two loudspeakers, one loudspeaker, dual mono. You want them to be separated. You can have pop rock shows. We have artists on tour. We have residencies in LA. We have Katy Perry. We have uh, Adele running uh, immersive live concerts with a band on stage. We have festivals. We have uh, electronic music. We have special events, corporate events. A lot of corporate events are liking Elisa because of the realism that it brings in the way of audio. If you have a very important speaker on stage who's walking and you can track that position, that's a really nice thing to have. So a lot of corporates are also uh, adopting that. That was a quick overview run of what Elisa or Immersive can bring to your events. Uh, different solutions uh, in the way of Immersive have different advantages, so you need to make a choice. But the fundamentals remain the same. Whatever we spoke about today will apply to any Immersive solution uh, anywhere. If you have any questions, this is a good time. We have one minute, 30 seconds. Yeah. So, uh, so I get the whole concept of uh, implementing this in a closed auditorium. It works out. You've got spaces where you can put up speakers. But what is the minimum speaker configuration needed when you're doing an outdoor show? It's the five. The five five on front. the stage. That's about Over it. the stage. That's you don't minimum. need any... You don't need this. The, everything is optional. So it's an open format, unlike a Dolby Atmos, where it's... What is the format now? It's 9. Dot 7. Dot 4. Dot 1. Dot something. So, <laughs> yeah. so we're not a fixed format. Okay. You can pick any format. You can put speakers anywhere you want, as long as you don't break the rules. Right. You can put speakers anywhere. So you can have just the frontal, Fine. you can have just frontal and sides, or you can have sides plus back, or you can add the overheads. Everything is but an add-on. Just with frontal also I can achieve just pretty the five, much you the will same. achieve everything that we did. Okay. So our voices, separation, that'll work with the five because that's all you need. The right. stage. Everything right. is gonna move from that end of the stage to that end of the stage. So for outdoor concerts, that's perfectly fine. Right. And my second question is I know uh, this is exclusive with L acoustic. But can I use like a different speaker system with the Lisa processor? Ooh, no. That's no, uh, mainly because of how the whole ecosystem works. Right. Uh, I'm sure the other manufacturers will do a similar thing. But uh, for our processor to know where the speakers are, you need to design it in SoundVision. And you can only design acoustic speakers in SoundVision. You can't design others. And it won't know what to do with the speakers. So it's, it's a full ecosystem. It's not to tie you in. It's not to lock you in. But that is what is needed for an ecosystem like this to work. It's the same thing with presets. You remember 10 years ago, you could buy any amp, you could buy any DSP, you could buy any loudspeaker and put them together. Today, you can't do that because the whole thing is designed from start to finish to be one unit. Yeah? You, you buy a car today, you buy a car. You don't buy tires and engine and seats and windshield and everything from different places and put it together. Will it work? Yes, it will work. Well, what's it called? Jugard. Yeah? Yeah, you don't uh, want that. You want a, you want a proper last car. One, last one on this. Uh, so basically for a uh, classical concert or a symphony orchestra, you've got different elements mm -hmm. as it is on the stage. But for uh, electronic music where you're just getting two tracks from the uh, DJ console, is, is there a way where the Lisa processor sort of separates it and just puts it out in the number of speakers? Is there a way the processor does it? AI, AI will get us there. We're okay. not there yet. Yeah. But that brings up an interesting point because Electronic music is actually one of the easiest to convert into immersive if it's a proper electronic music production where they have stems. So you go to the producer, you go to the DJ and say, hey, don't give me left, right. Can you give me eight stems? Can you give me 16 stems? And this is what you can do. I'll give you a, a fader, a, a, an encoder, and you can throw these stems wherever you want. I'll give you a rotating or automated pan. You can throw something on that. So electronic music is actually the easy, one of the easier ones to have full immersive, like full 360. Doing it with music is hard. Yeah. But you need to ask them. You can be like, can you give me eight stems? Don't give me stereo. Give me eight stems, and I'll give you eight encoders, and you can throw them wherever you want. Nobody will say no to that. Nobody guess. Yeah. Thank you all for your time. And enjoy the rest of the show. So can you please be on stage? I would like Mrs. Smita Rai, Director, Palm AVICN, to...
share a small token of appreciation. Please, audience, give a round of applause for Mr. Rahul Samuel. Thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful session. Yeah.